So thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's uh, an absolute pleasure and honor to uh, to be back here again. Um, I was an attendee uh, exclusively last year and spoke the year before. Uh, we had a great turnout actually yesterday, which was uh, which was wonderful. Um, and they've gifted me with a slot where everybody is going to be wanting to go out for lunch as soon as this is over. So I know that I get your uh, maximum attention for the, the total time that you're here because you're waiting for that bell. And I, I can assure you, we're probably going to go right up to the bell. That's, that's the way it worked yesterday. I'll probably make sure that there's some time for questions if we've got any. Um, and uh, as I say, I appreciate you being here so that we can share some of what I consider to be a very important piece of subject matter, but I'm going to take a slightly different tact and perhaps provide some uh, different perspectives for you in this area of quality management systems as it relates to uh, the aviation and other environments today. Um, a lot of uh, challenges are being faced, of course, in this area, and uh, I think we've got something to share. The operative word for me in quality and safety management is sharing. Um, this is one area of your business that I don't personally believe on a philosophical level that uh, uh, quality and safety are secrets. I think that the way to move forward is to share the best practices with everyone. And in the audits that were mentioned, we did over 40 uh, specific audits last year. We do a, what I'd call an advanced level of quality and safety audit um, that takes a different attack to a different approach. Uh, we look at the organizational, uh, really looking to mine down to a baseline level uh, and establish then where people and processes are within a system uh, against what you really say you're doing. And you're going to see some of the tricks that we use here. They're not tricks, but the techniques and the tactics and the, the things that we're doing. So quality and safety is shared throughout our community because there really aren't any business trade secrets in these things. <coughs> so we're going to look at quality uh, beyond compliance, and that's what this is all about. And I'm going to start off with a, just a short video that uh, really had some impact on me, and I thought um, it would be well worth it to share in this particular program. It sets a tone. So we'll wait for YouTube to come up. It's waking up this morning. One of the most important ways to realize our vision of becoming a powerhouse for sustainable aviation development is to embrace, integrate, and enhance quality in all phases of our project life cycle. Let's see what uh, YouTube is doing to us here. I think so, yeah. One of the most important yeah, this is actually what quality looks like. <laughs> it's a classic, a classic piece of timing. And by the way, I can recover from this. This is not something that's the form. Uh, it did work quite well One yesterday, so I'm just wondering perhaps this video component is, uh, is not working well on the computer. I won't spend too much time, but, but as I say, it's a poignant piece, so it may be well worth uh, waiting for. Let's just shut that down. You think so, Paul? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It may not. It may not be working for us, which would be a shame. What we'll do is we'll pass on that, and we'll come back to that and see if we can uh, we can get through it. The video was quite interesting because it, it talks a little bit about where I was going to go. We talk about the Toyota issue because the Toyota quality issue is is a very important and a tangible piece of uh, uh, you know of of the discussion and the challenges that Toyota faced in that area. Um, as I say, I, I really will try to come back to it. Uh, first of all, we're going into an area where there is a true regulatory paradox, and this is one of the this is one of the things that we continually observe uh, with some of the organizations that we're auditing uh, is that they're challenged because the, the logical path by which this system is sort of implemented in Canada, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about Canada and the U.S. and uh, Europe because we do have an international audience here and certainly we work in all of those arenas. Um, the regulatory paradox is that there is a conundrum that's set up. You can see 
challenges like economy and freefall, the nanny state, oil refinery disasters. Um, you may have seen a presentation where Obama is, is pointing fingers and Halliburton is pointing fingers and Transocean is pointing fingers in the BP oil disaster. Uh, there are challenges that are there uh, where in that case the regulator wasn't providing a effective oversight or they, they, they actually let a few things go. And we'll have a look at what some of those paradoxes are. First of all, when we talk about a quality management system and a safety management system and a flight operation within your organization, which one of those three elements has a regulated requirement for quality assurance, but not at the airline level, just below that in Canada? Which has a regulated requirement for quality assurance? Maintenance. Just maintenance. And that happens actually in the United States and Canada, and it was. EASA is going down a path which is, which is pretty interesting. We'll talk about that more specifically. But so maintenance has a regulatory requirement for quality assurance. Therefore, we all then made quality assurance systems to meet a maintenance regulatory requirement. We didn't put quality assurance systems in place because we knew that they brought value to the organization necessarily. We did that for a regulatory requirement. That's a challenge. The paradox is, though, that you weren't told to put one in for a flight operation. You are encouraged and told in the ICAO model as the third pillar to put an assurance system in for essentially what it is is a closed loop reporting for a safety management report. How many people think that it, during our audits we actually see the development of at least two independent quality assurance systems within the same company. If they have an AMO, uh, an approved maintenance organization, a flight operation, and of course the associated administrative staff. I can't tell you how many times we see two independent quality systems being created in the same company under the responsibility of two independent people. Sometimes they share stories, sometimes they don't. That is a challenge. Let's add the dimension of flight operations. Initially, we talked flight operations quality assurance, FOQA, which is, of course, in its original form as it came to us, was the electronic capture of data delivered from aircraft systems, delivered from helicopter, helicopter systems, talking about operating and performance parameters. So we're looking at the actual mechanics, the information coming in there. And we can do some tremendous trending tremendous identification of problems, lots of great predictive stuff as well with that information. That's great. Close squad. So all of a sudden we've got an electronic system, but as a quality assurance professional, I would ask this question. Is not quality assurance a, a component of all of the business aspects? But from a regulatory perspective, and primarily the reason you went into this in the first place, you've been doing it for the regulatory purpose which of course is, is a challenge. So multiple quality systems being created in isolation within one company. I have actually seen, and I, I had to count the number because I didn't do that yesterday's presentation. I have actually seen 15 instances in 42 audits in the last 14 months of three separate quality assurance systems for one for flight ops, one for SMS, and one for quality assurance and never the twain shall meet until an auditor comes around and says, hmm, this is an interesting concept. I want to see how this works. The regulatory structure may have some ambiguity and some built-in conflicts of interest. Let's explore that for a second. Can anybody, does anybody have any insight into where I'm going before I even get going? You're going to save me a lot of breath, save me a lot of words. Where am I going with this? The regulatory structure has a built-in conflict of interest in the effective and best practice governance of quality management systems. Well, <laughs> throw me a bone, people. Uh, St. Clair, let, let's, let's, let's explore that for a second. Not going quite where I want to go, but, but this is a good point, is that 
first of all, some people in here are aware in Canada, and I'll focus on Canada here right now, that in Canada, in 2010, the end of 2010, the Auditor General report for Canada released a report uh, on Transport Canada that said, you don't have an internal quality management system. Fascinating. In 2011, they came back and said, you still don't have an internal quality management system, and there's no possible way that they could develop one in a year, of course. But not only did they say that you still don't have one, they said, you don't even have a project plan for implementing a quality management system. So the very regulator that's regulating this complete sort of uh, oversight of the regulations does not have an internal system, which is one of the reasons they are not coming up with the data that you're talking about, which is, uh, we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough time. We're, we're, we are doing a risk-based approach to looking at operators, right? And so that considers whether you're in an air taxi uh, or a utility operation, you know, or an airline operation. That's what they're doing. And, and, it, and it's a tremendous program for, you know, doing a, you know, a, a basic overall review. But, again, in our audit context, we're finding operators that have not been audited in the last five years. Well, programs have changed dramatically in the last five years. So when the regulator does come and they're looking for a, a functional quality management system, they may not find one. And of course, the operator is going to be left holding the bag because they do have a regulatory responsibility. But that's not where I'm going. The ambiguity or conflicting interest is that the regulations clearly say that in a maintenance organization in Canada, the quality assurance manager, a regulated requirement, is going to report up through to who? Director of maintenance. What if that person is the person who hired that quality manager? There is a conflict of interest, and of course the next, the next challenge is we've got the reported line, the dotted line. When we've got that dotted line report, I unfortunately am the skeptic and I say, if I'm in an organization that doesn't support those levels of open communication, we have a problem. On the safety management side, who is the safety manager reporting up through in a flight op or in a safety management, uh, sorry, in a flight op or a, an AMO if you've got a safety management position? Same thing, right? Same thing, coming back up through that management structure. So it, it's not that it can't work, but it's putting a significant level of maturity and onus on an organization to understand the conflict, the nature of the conflict of interest. And later in the, in the chat, you're gonna find out why I don't feel or that we have observed that that's something that can actually be demonstrated to be working. It is in a few organizations, but not in many. So th th this is, it's a challenge. We've compromised the integrity of independent quality oversight just by the design of the system. It's, it's not anyone's fault, it's the way the system was created. But a quality professional, and, and, and certainly you can't talk about quality without talking about W. Edwards Deming, but, but the point is, is Deming is rolling around in his in his little capsule in the ground when he sees a system sort of created like that because it, it, it's not designed to work effectively. By the way, that was a, a picture from less than a month ago over in uh, the south of France. I was doing some work with a client over there, so the tiger was out, it was pretty exciting. <laughs> so, pretty neat stuff. So, the cars require maintenance and SMS to have that quality evaluation program. A absolutely essential, we need, a, we need some form of, of oversight, there's no question about it. And here's what the cars say. This is a direct quote. The person responsible for maintenance shall establish an audit system in respect to the quality assurance program. Okay? Let's dissect the language. Let's not interpret the language, but let's dissect it so that we can come to some level agreement. Because this is a fairly clear statement. The person responsible for maintenance shall establish an audit system in respect of the quality assurance program. What big assumption is being made when that very clear regulatory statement is posted like that. What assumption is being made? The assumption is? Uh, yes, audits will take place, I'll absolutely agree, and so shall establish an audit system. There's a, a, there's a bigger assumption that if it's not clearly understood, we have a problem, Houston. And what is that? You have to have a program, there's, okay, we're still, but we're still not at the, Um, that, that's a good point. Touchdown, Seahawks. It assumes that the person responsible for maintenance 
knows what quality assurance and a quality assurance program is if we're putting control at that level. But we're not assured that that PRM has that understanding. We're not assured that that PRM in their suite of tricks has had any training or, or, or relatively significant training to be able to actually understand, interpret, and guide the direction necessary for a successful program. So that's a big assumption that we're sitting there with. Another statement, shall establish and maintain a quality assurance program that is under the sole control of the person responsible for the maintenance control system. This is a legal requirement. This is a legal position that that post holder, to use a, an, a, 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 a European term, this is a legal position that that person holding that position has, and therefore they are going to take that legal responsibility, in most cases, to heart. They're also going to take it to heart, which means that the flexibility and control of the program, if it's under that person who may or may not have the skill set necessary, it's incumbent upon them to go out and get that training or to bring somebody in who can, and now we're talking about size and scope of an organization, can you afford to do that? Remember, these regulations apply to everyone. And so we have a possible break in the system right at that level, right at the management, the functional management level. The assumption that these things are clearly understood and that we can do something with them. So there is a move afoot, I'm aware, and I, I'm not sure what the status of it is uh, now, but it is, I think it's a good move. And that's to take those positions of quality assurance manager and, I argue, safety manager, and move those into a regulatory framework where there's a legal responsibility for that management position and role as well. And thereby, you're going to create a horizontal management structure where you've got a quality manager, a safety manager, a PRM, person responsible for maintenance, and a flight ops manager and any other in that horizontal and more business appropriate, business proven methodology to remove conflict of interest. Because then those specific managers are now reporting back up to the accountable executive. And so we've got ourselves a cleaner system. So my point here is that you've been thrust in, and this is, this is an international issue, but you're gonna see EASA uh, approaches to this, which I think are moving along the right lines in, in the latest iteration. Uh, this is a structure that has been built with a flaw from the beginning, and it's created a significant amount of context uh, challenge and problems for people trying to move forward in this environment. Well, let's, if we wait till we get a little further along here, I think I'll show you how we can stitch that together and make that work. Um, have we considered these kinds of problems before? You can be darn right, because I'm, I'm, I'm a puzzle person. I, there's puzzle pieces missing from this equation, and I've got to figure out what's missing. So this is a result of 25 years of, of consideration. Um, and, and from input, actually from some people in this room. So there's a more clearly defined system. If we look at the EASA regs, uh, some of these are in, in draft right now, and uh, they're, they're actually hot off the press. But the OR, the organizational requirements in the EASA part 145, which is on the maintenance side, um, the management system. I like that. First of all, it's a management system. They've taken out the ambiguity of what it is. We're now going to treat it like a business process. Process for our American friends. FAR 11965, more ambiguity. Management personnel for Part 121, which is airlines, does not specifically mention a quality assurance uh, manager. They talk about a chief inspector. They've left that ambiguity there. What the heck? A chief inspector to me is a guy that is the top dog in the organization or the girl in the top dog in the organization that inspects the product for return to service. Like they've got the most experience. We forgot the quality part. So they are struggling with these issues. We, we do a lot of work with uh, um, airports as well in our business and they go through the same quality management requirements. Um, uh, they are also in Canada, the, the other legislated group, uh, at least the top 10 airports in Canada are the legislated group to have SMS and quality programs and they've had the same kinds of struggles. Same kinds of struggles. And it's because of the way the regulations have been, have been described up to this point. So back on the ASA side, 145A65, that's their management system. 
Uh, these are some of the things that it says. Yes, I love this. I love this. This, this just turns a guy's, you know, my crank on a guy like me. A function to monitor compliance of the organization. Holy smokes. What, what does the word compliance mean? You know, where are we? Compliance. What's, what's compliance? What's that word doing for us? A regulatory minimum. Can I extend that one, though, just a bit? Brian, I'm going to extend that just a bit. It is a regulatory minimum. So we have a requirement under regulations to comply. What are we complying with when we're complying under regulations? What is my company A actually complying with? Am I complying with regulations or am I complying with something else? This is a concept that I'd love to put on the table here and let uh, hear some of your thoughts. Am I complying with regulations in my company or am I complying with something else? Excellent. You are complying with your policy, which is, in all regulatory jurisdictions around the world, approved by the regulatory body as your means of compliance with the regulations. So I'm trying to help you get rid of these car references and these FAR references and these EASA references out of these manuals, get them out of there. It's your policy, it's your process, it's your procedures that are complying with the regulations, and they are approved. Your policy, your process, and your procedures are actually the property of the person responsible for that area of the business. That's their concern. So as a manager, they should be worried about our compliance and the harmonization of our policy, process, and procedures against the regs. Think about your documentation, not so much about the regs. Make sure that you have people monitoring those things. Make sure that you have people updating those things. Make sure that you're feeding that information of change back into the process. But it's your policy, your process, and your procedures that your people who work for, in, and around you are using, not specifically the regs. But somebody needs to be an expert. I would argue two people need to be an expert. The manager of that position and the quality person or quality manager who's holding that sort of audit independent oversight internally. So, I love this. A function to monitor compliance of the organization. Yes, compliance with the regulations, but I, I argue a little bit further and say, not just the regulation, more specifically internally, your policy process and procedures, which you're approved to operate under the regs. They also suggest that you need a feedback system of findings. So, we have to, it implies we have to check something, and we have to check it against something, a standard, and then we have to have a means of communicating the findings. Right? So it's a formal process. And by the way, these, um, all presentations uh, will be available to all delegates uh, following the program. They, uh, they send out an email, so, so uh, I mean, if you want to take notes, by all means, but at the same time, this kind of stuff is, uh, is available too. So it's, uh, that, that's why I've gone and, and thrown caution to the wind. I put a lot of information on here, fully aware that, that that's not what they say PowerPoints are all about, but this helps you uh, remember things. Also to ensure effective implementation of corrective, act corrective actions is necessary. So now you're being told you, you need a, a function to monitor compliance. You need to have some kind of a feedback system. You need to ensure effective implementation. So we need to have good follow-up activity, good analysis. This is where we get into root cause analysis. So they're telling you in EASA that these are the things you need. By the way, these are not approved yet, I don't believe. I think the last rewrite was uh, uh, in the summer. They, they could very well be approved, but I, I'm not sure whether they are yet. And they talk about audits focusing on the integrity of the organization's management system and periodically assessing the status of, look at this. This is the maintenance management system telling you that you gotta look at the integrity of our management system. Is the management system working? guess what kind of quality checklist you're gonna have to have? Not only for your policy process and procedures a, a, as we have a standard checklist items, but you're gonna have to have checklists to check the integrity and the function of your management system. Because if we left those out of the equation, the system may not be working at a fundamental level, the management level. So you're going to have to create a checklist that works within that context to make sure that the management, that includes people, their training, their function, or the follow-up activities, are things being done in a timely fashion? If you say that you're going to have an immediate uh, follow-up activity within three days, and that three days is not being adhered to, 
we now have a structured problem. It doesn't mean that the person with the follow-up activity can't do it in three days, but maybe their workload is too busy. It's not possible for them to achieve it in three days. So now we've got a bigger picture item. Notice how these are all interconnected. It's a very, very intricate sort of a, 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 an environment. Very cool. And periodically assessing the status of safety risk. So in each area of business, we've got to look at, are the safety risk controls actually working? I mean, a, a, a great analogy, this didn't happen, but it could happen. You're in, a you're in a corporate flight department that has business jets, and you have this high value client worth $2.4 billion going into this $14.8 million aircraft. On board they go. Down they go to Las Vegas. They're going down there for the weekend. The pilot, the flight crew lands, they disgorge the passengers, wonderful experience. <coughs> They go to fill up the aircraft. They can't pay for the gas because the aircraft card goes bing. Sorry, sir, this card is declined. So the captain goes, oh my God, this is just ridiculous. What is going on? This is the third time this has happened in the last eight months. I've talked about this before, okay? Captain pulls out his card, but unfortunately the amount of gas and his personal limit is too high. Runs it through, bing, uh-oh. What about they go to the first officer? First officer may not have credit. That may be a young person in the system. Maybe they don't have credit. So now how do we pay for gas? Do we, do we ask the paying client? Listen, can you pay for this gas? We'll get you when you get back. I mean, it's the last time the client's gonna come to that company, right? This is not a true story, but it's almost a true story. Or the first officer has the credit goes and buys the gas, so now they've got gas, saves the embarrassment. What have we just done in a CRM situation to those two crew members? Have we increased the stress as a result of this activity? I would argue that we have, okay? So we have a human factors issue, a CRM issue as a result of this problem that was really no result, no, no, no fault of their own. They're a very professional flight crew. But the first officer's wife went out to buy the Manolo Blenix or the Christian Labutans with the red bottoms. How would I know that? I have no idea. But my point is, <laughs> but, but <laughs> I can't help looking. Uh, but, but my point is, she goes to buy them, at however, however much they are, and the card goes boing. So he gets a call immediately because that one's not waiting. He gets a call. So now we've enhanced, we've added to the problem. And the problem actually is a quality problem. Can anybody see where the quality problem might lay for that? C gas cards are bouncing and boing. Company has the money, by the way. Um, I, I, let's, go into the, let's go into the structural problem that exists within a company that its pilots aren't able to pay for gas on, 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 on the company credit card. Is anybody in finance or have any direct relationship with, with apportioning money within a company for those things? The the finance department has shuffled their various um, uh, card limits around arbitrarily to meet specific requirements. It's telling us that the finance group is operating independently of the operational group and don't necessarily have an understanding of the relationship with the operational group. I suggest that quality and safety management activities include all administrative functions, by the way, and you'll see that in a minute. But that's what's happened is finance is just moving these, these amounts around, but they're not correlating, not tying that into an aircraft, a crew, a time interval, a, a client. And by not doing that, we've compromised safety risk controls because we've really enhanced the challenges for that poor flight crew who really only need uh, the pressures of the flight environment to deal with, not the pressures of a financial environment. If I went around the room here and if I went around with a full house yesterday and asked, I, I know that we would have some hands raised about those similar types of issues. So I love this system because it's, it's, it's telling us a little bit more. It's telling us a little bit more about what it is that we need to, uh, we need to consider. How do you recognize what quality performance really is? Well, it has to be a mutual benef mutually beneficial relationship. You'll notice that if you have done quality training before, I'm taking out some words that you standard that you see on a, on a, on a normal day-to-day uh, -day process. 
it's a mutual beneficial relationship. And what's missing from there is between the, the client and the, and, 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 and the company or between the recipient. And I, I'm taking that out because it's very hard for us to, it's hard for me to understand. I work in this environment. So let's make it into a language that we can understand. You have to participate. It's a two-way street. You want something, I'm going to provide that something. Am I providing it to a standard and level of quality that you expect, expect and perhaps demand? Uh, or am I not? Or you're wanting something, but I'm just not able to do that. As much as I want that business, I can't do it. Right? It's a mutually beneficial relationship. Quality performance has to be acted upon using fact-based decisions. How do we come up with facts within a quality environment? Any thoughts, any ideas? How do we come up with facts? Data. 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 Perfect. Data. Yeah. Star Trek, right? That's data. Data, fact-based decisions. We have to capture data, data somehow. I argue that the a method of quality assurance auditing should be able to provide you, as if you make effective checklists, with data. And if you can handle that data effectively, it can actually begin to give you trends and indications. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? We're going to talk a little bit about leading, lagging indicators uh, down the road. <coughs> Making quality a habit in the company. Easy to say, not easy to do, unless we have management buy-in to a quality program, understanding for a quality program, and absolute accountability for each other's role within the quality program. So in other words, managers need to insist that people are using the quality system. And if people using the quality system don't really understand it, then managers, managers have a responsibility to ensure that the equivalent or appropriate level of training is in place. They are accountable for providing the people and process to do what we say we're doing. It's critical. Sharing experiences and best practices. It, it is, quite frankly, the reason I'm here. I can stand in front of a crowd without too much fear and share those practices and things that I've observed and that others share with us through the course of the work that we do on the stage. So sharing best practices. You can do that inside your organization and outside your organization. A choice to be involved. It doesn't work without participation. It's, it's as simple as that. So again, like you, you can't talk about quality without talking about Demis, uh, Deming because he's the, really the father of modern quality assurance. So in, in a book published in about 1980, if I remember correctly, uh, Deming said that a system cannot understand itself. It requires a view from the outside. Very, very important, simple words. A system can't understand itself. It needs a look from out here. How come? Why do we have to look from out here? Complacency. How about a word that starts with O? Or a story of O? Objectivity. Right? Yeah, can you be objective looking at your own system? There's, there's some neat arguments. There is some uh, capability of being objective. If you've got a trained audit team or a, a trained auditor, that doesn't mean they have to have a PhD. If you have a trained auditor and you have exceptional quality assurance checklists, you can maintain a reasonable close approximation to being objective. But this is one of the reasons with the regs designed the way they are, where you've got a quality manager reporting up through some other functional manager that may have hired them, and a safety manager doing the same thing that may have hired them. That objectivity is lost because this person doing that may have a concern for their, their job. There's, other, and, and there's another piece that creeps into that as well uh, from an internal company position is that we want our company to succeed. We know if we put this roadblock of an observed quality assurance uh, failure of a system in front of us, it may inhibit our ability to do our job, to make the money, to keep our job. And people have that sense and feeling within them. They don't want to affect the working environment, not, not specifically for themselves, but for the others, their colleagues. There is that inherent fear that's a part of a quality management system. If you're not aware of that, it can jump up and hit you. So 
you, you really need to have that external perspective in cases. And, and within your company, you need that separation of those roles. That's how we can, that's the best effort that we can, that we can make internally to have objectivity when we're looking at something. Trained people, understanding the challenges that you, that you uh, undergo as a human being to operate in a quality system. In other words, don't judge. Don't come in with preconceived notions or ideas. Come in with an objective viewpoint and use an objective checklist which was created by your subject matter experts who are being evaluated. Objective, internal participation in creation of checklists, not the manager, but the people on the line doing the job, the ones that are hot and heavy. Against your policy, you've created yourself an exceptional checklist with a good chance for objectivity by having a trained auditor who understands the human failings that we have associated with auditing. What is a quality template? Continuing what it looks like. Deming said the first step is transformation of the individual. How many here knew that W. Edwards Deming's principal fundamental tenant for successful quality management was the knowledge, the skill, and the ability of the person? It's, it's not about the structure. It's certainly about the structure. But the first tenet is about the individuals within that system. Do they have the tools they need to do the job that we ask them to do? Because if they don't, then the system is already starting with a flaw. So first step is transformation of the individual. Transformation is a big word. People don't change immediately. It's intermittent. It's hit and miss. It's when the situation and the appropriate time is, is available. Or when I've read a new piece of material and go, oh, I didn't know that. Or when you've attended a place like this. You're learning things. It's an intermittent process. It's a continuing evolution. And when the individual begins to understand the system of profound knowledge, it's important to understand what that really means. So let's have a look at what that, that means. When you talk about profound knowledge, you've got to understand that system that you're working in. You've got to understand the components and the parts of that system, how you fit in with that, how, you're, how they are supposed to work in the best situation within your company. So you've got to have an appreciation for the system. You need to know what variation looks like. Here's a perfect example, or as near a perfect example as we can get. Here's an example that is missing this. Here's an example that's missing a little bit more. Here's an example that's completely out of control. Um, I audited a company uh, not so long ago that has had a demonstrably enormous level of growth. So all good things in business. I mean, unbelievably enormous level of growth in a very short window of time. And what's happening in that structure is that the very first premise of management of change is not solid enough for any manager in that system to put their finger on where they are at any given time against the big plan. Because the big plan is not really intact. So they're actually living on a pretty much a day-to-day -day growth model, which is a challenge. And you'll see why in a second. The variation is that if a plan is not in place, I've got nothing to measure against the plan. And it works like this. It's one of these crazy pieces of physics. I looked at this board and I went, guys, you're, you're, you're well, not only that, but you're not going to give me any markers that work. There's point, that's point A. Really, you don't need to see my writing. There's point B. And there's the journey that we're on. I think anybody in this room could understand that if I could put some value to this, there's zero, there's one. This isn't math, so I'll keep everybody with me. There's zero, there's one. We know that if we take a step or a series of steps, we're going to get from the starting point to the finishing point. But what we're talking about when we talk about variation is we're talking about where are we on that roadmap? And I know that I've got at least one engineer in here who understands this particular sort of creep and deterioration a move towards chaos is actually taking place in all physical activities within the universe. What's the, what's the name of that word? It starts with an E. Anybody know? Entropy. 
So things are basically coming apart over time, right? St. Clair's here because I planted him here, he's, he's just in case. Yeah. No, uh, things are coming apart over time. And so it, it's natural to know that a system that we have in place without monitoring it, without evaluating it over time, it's probably going somewhere other than where we want it. it it's moving in a direction. If that, if that direction is clear and the instructions are clear, it's gonna have a better chance of getting there, but we're not so sure where it is. So variation is very important to understand and understand that the systems that you built are actually breaking down as soon as you build them. They're breaking down before you even build them, right? Because that's the, the, the state of the universe. <coughs> so we have two types of knowledge that we talk about when we're talking about this profound knowledge. There's the knowledge of how. So I'm, I'm riding a bicycle. There are, I think we could all agree, physics associated with riding a bicycle. There are physics associated with me being able to remain upright move in a direction on that bicycle. That is the knowledge of how. But really, what we work in, for the most part, is the knowledge that. I know that if I get on this bicycle, I am going to be able to ride this bicycle by turning the pedals and I'm gonna get to where I wanna go. Right? The knowledge of that is really what's important for us at this working level. We're not designing and creating things necessarily. So we need the knowledge of that. And then unfortunately, or fortunately, we have to understand some things. Psychology of the individual, the group, the organization. Let me give an example. When I was at the Mars, um, not on Mars, but at the Mars, uh, one of the projects that I thought might be of value would be that when you've got a great big old airplane that's uh, you know, built in the 1940s, 1946 actually, uh, to be honest, um, that aircraft with those radial engines and when there's a flaw in the design of the engine structure, the castings, you're gonna have cylinders cracking. And when you're flying on a fire and the power is coming up and the power is coming off, this poor old thing is working very hard. And it's inevitable that we're going to have a cylinder fail or crack or whatever, which is gonna result in the aircraft having to be brought down, maintenance is going to have to take place, cylinders are gonna have to change. You might even lose an engine depending on the nature of the failure. So I thought, let's be preemptive about this. Let's assume, because the data substantiates that, let's assume that we're gonna have an engine failure. Is there any way that we can prevent a cylinder failure during operation? And, and the reality is, is you can mitigate, and I'm a mitigate word person, you can mitigate the risk to a certain level by enhancing the oversight, the audit inspection of the item that you're concerned about. So the answer is take a modern tool, a boroscope, a light device that allows us to look into uh, obnoxious areas that you can't otherwise see, and examine these inside cylinders for potential damage, cracks, deficiencies, deformities, things like that, things that would make a cylinder fail. Talk about profound knowledge. You need to understand those concepts. You need to understand what you're looking for. And to make this really work, what do we need? What do we really need? Uh, procedures, but even, yeah, uh, yes, we need procedures, but, but what do we really need? I, I, I'm standing here. Knowledge, knowledge of knowing what to do, yes. And that all refers to us, doesn't it? People. We need people. Say again? A spare cylinder, <laughs> spare cylinder yeah. Got lots of those, actually. I, but I don't want to be changed, yeah. We have to have people who can do the job, because remember, this is a preemptive strike. This is a preventative strike. And so what else, what else do we have to have within the person that we're going to choose or persons that we're gonna choose? What do we need from those people? Remember, we're talking about doing something in advance of something happening. So what do we need from those people? Knowledge, willingness. We have to be, and here's a management a concept for you again, we have to be choosing and knowing our people and the psychology associated with what kind of person do I want to have doing this job? Not just the last person standing, most likely not the most senior person there because they've seen that he's been there, done that, and what are you doing? That's something new, we never did that before. You need to have eager, keen knowledge and awareness of someone who is going they're gonna be angry if they don't find a problem. So here's the psychology of what it is that we're doing. You can't choose somebody or a group of somebody 
who don't have the desire to find the problem for which you're doing this activity. Because if, if, if you choose somebody who doesn't, chances are they're not going to find anything. So I handpicked three individuals for that activity, gave them the relevant training that they needed, and also said, listen, in the event that we're not quite sure, let's pull it anyway. Before, before we do that, let's go back to somebody who is boroscope qualified, and we'll have a second look before we do it. But there were no roadblocks to them identifying and actioning what they thought was the case. But there was the assistance there if they needed it to go forward. So you have to know your people, your group, your organization. If there's a reluctance to new ideas, we're talking about an organizational psychology that we have to overcome. This is why this path that you're going down in safety and quality management is so very, very challenging. Because as many of you have probably attended sessions, including with Simon Sinek last night, uh, we had the executive briefing yesterday as well. I, I loved it because it was intimate. Um, you have to go down these places that we're not normally familiar with going down in order to have a measurable level of success in these environments. Because this is no longer about turning the wrench. It's no longer about flying the aircraft or the helicopter. It's actually about managing people and process to achieve goals and objectives and outcomes that uh, you want to achieve. And you need to measure your progress because you're investing in this thing. So very, very, very interesting conundrums uh, that we set up here. What does a quality management system look like? This is one. This is, a, this is an approach that I've taken with, um, with the work that we do. Uh, and there's a quality management system. It's right there in the middle. There's some key elements that are absolutely essential to have an effective quality management system. The first one is that we've got to have planning. And it's not the maintenance department. It's not the flight ops department. It's not the administrative staff. It's the management team in general within the organization because I'm going to put forward a premise that quality assurance take a certain, or quality management systems take a certain appearance. So the planning includes identifying what are the objectives that we're looking to achieve here. Remember this little roadmap from A to B? It's a simple roadmap. But if I don't even know that that's point A and I don't know that this is point B and I don't know that I want to move along this way, I think we can all understand that people are going to go whichever direction is appropriate for them, right? So without having clear objectives every year and an ability to measure where we are along the pursuit of those objectives, then we're setting ourselves up for a challenge. We have to describe the requirements. We have to describe the process that we're going to apply. And we've got to talk about the people and the time that we need to do this. And that includes their skill sets. That includes their availability. That includes the locations of different bases if you've got multiple bases. So that's quality planning. Without that, I do, or I say that we're living day to day. That's the way we do it. You know, there's a lot of day to day living in aviation still. Um, we're getting better because we're learning more. The quality control activities, making sure that from point A to point B, now we've labeled them because we have some objectives and some goals and some targets and how we're going to do this. Um, now we're going to do some quality control checks. We're going to make sure that the process that's underway is actually the way we want it to be, because I'd rather have it headed off a third of the way through the, the voyage than, than do it uh, all the way at the end and find out we have a problem. So those are the monitoring and the analysis. Are we moving along the path that we kind of chose, the kind of path that we planned? By the way, you can see how this fits into a, a management of change in a sense, because people know where they are at any given time. Remember, managers are there to manage people and process to accomplish the tasks, the objectives, and the goals that we set to meet targets that are, that are put forward. They need to be able to measure where they are. But if you're living day to day, wow, you know, put a significant level of change in, 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 in play and, and talk to each individual manager across the board. And again, I have the privilege and the luxury of doing that. They cannot say where the organization is in general. Therefore, the term that we're using there that isn't in place is alignment. There is no management alignment in the accomplishment of the bigger picture. Everybody is living day to day, and therefore they are under pressure when they're doing that. Because when you measure your progress, I'm not anywhere near where I expected to be. Quality assurance activity, so we're going to look at and make sure within the quality department and engage in the functional managers that we have the internal audit. Boy, that's a bad spelling mistake. Management process reviews, making sure that un management understands where you are at any given time. 
Uh, we need qualifications for personnel. We need a report card, the snapshot, the audit completed document, possibly an executive summary. And we're going to use some tools within this framework here, root cause analysis, corrective and preventative actions um, that are essential to the effective resolution of those challenges and problems. When we have the report card, we can also compare departments or we can compare uh, major areas of management ag against each other to see whether or not we've got any systemic uh, creeping issues across the board, right? Because this is the place that you can see that. And then ultimately, the net result of all of this energy and effort that you're putting forward is over to the lower right, which is the quality improvement. That's the net result of a quality system working. You know, you need to see improvement because why are you doing it otherwise? Right? It's an improvement to your business process. It's an improvement to the way you do business. Um, as Patrick Hudson says, it's the way we do things around here. Quality systems have to be part of the way we do things around here. Um, and then ultimately, that external audit is that perfect piece to help validate that you're moving down that path because that truly is the objective audit. Now, how many people in this group here undergo audits um, on a consistent basis from people who are consuming services from you? Hands, show of hands. So b well better than half, three quarters of the room. You're getting audited by external agencies. Those are completely total opportunities for improvement that are free in the most, in the most part. Right. Um, and then of course, the regulator is fantastic because we actually set our audit protocols so that we evaluate, because remember, I'm doing organizational and intrapersonal audits on the people, the systems, and the structure against best practices from around the world. 75% of what we look at is quality and safety initiatives and the ability to do what you say you are doing or the ability to act against what best practices are for your industry around the world. 25% is regulatory. Because quite frankly, that's the easy part. Quality and safety is much more difficult because of the reasons I'm talking about. Organization, people, interpersonal relationships, documentary and fact evidence, much, much more difficult. Because the regulatory uh, environment is a little bit more specific. So what we do is we use data from these other audits because it is data, it's, there's evidentiary based uh, uh, items that are there which you could do yourself internally from all of those audits you have. Look at those audits. Don't treat them as individual audits. Treat them as an aggregate of data that may be able to paint pictures within your environment. Really good stuff. This is, this one's, this one's mine. I had to, I had to really put some thought into what are we really looking at? This is any this is aviation context, so this is any aviation company in the world at any level who has a flight operations and a maintenance component to their company. Any company in the world. They also have an administrative component. Where does the accountable executive live in this diagram? Oh, I love it. Home run. Absolutely in the center. Uh, but, but, but they're not just, they're just not living in the center. They're kind of touching all of the spaces, aren't they? They're not a dot, they're actually a, a circle. I thought about putting one in, but I thought, no, that'll be a better question. Where does the safety manager really live in this diagram? Where does the safety manager, take a stab. Anybody? This is a philosophical question. He's in the center, she's in the center, whoever it is. They are in the center. The accountable executive and the safety management systems manager are living in the center. And, and of course their sphere of influence touches all three. Both of them should have an open door. Both of them should have an open door. And not to belittle Stuart's point, because I absolutely agree, it's on the next slide, or in my case, it's on the next mirror image that's coming in. There's the system, right? We didn't talk about the manager. We talked about now it's the system. And the safety management system is a structure and a concept using the ICAO model, policy, risk management, assurance, and promotion that lives over top of the entire triangular organization. Notice that my safety management system is definitely including input and expecting input 
from the administrative side. Even the person that sweeps the floors in the hangar at night, because that's another set of eyes and ears, and they very much have a role to play in your safety management system. It needs to be a fully encapsulating communication system. If you're missing a part, your safety management system is missing a part. Regulatory compliance, regulatory structure of safety management systems is also set up to fail if you live by the letter of the system. It needs to be an encompassing act. What extra thing am I going to throw onto this diagram? And that's going to allow me to go back to a point that I talked about right at the beginning. What's coming next? Any thoughts, any ideas? What's coming next? I'm going to tell you, there is something coming on top of this diagram. OK? I'm going to give you a hint. What, what's coming next? No. No. We're beyond regulatory compliance when we're in the world of quality and safety management. What's coming in next? So we have an organization. We've got a, and I'm going to back this up just because I like how it comes back in. So remember what we said, the regulations, the regulations are infused over this whole piece. Right here at the maintenance side, we've got a regulatory requirement for quality assurance. We've got nothing refer referencing quality assurance here. We've got nothing referencing quality assurance here other than FOQA, but I do know that the reg is changing, and I do know that there is evidence of it showing up in certain, uh, well, certainly in the 705, it's, it's there, but for the other operators. Uh, and again, the same holds true in, in the global area. We just threw a, a blanket of safety management systems on top of this, so there it is. Notice it's got an assurance portion. W what do we want to eliminate? The ambiguity between a regulatory requirement for maintenance to have quality assurance, a potential regulatory or, or a proposed requirement for the safety management system, managed by another uh, person arguably, and its assurance component, but we've got nothing for admin, and we do have some flight ops quality assurance. We want to eliminate the ambiguity of a three-part quality assurance or quality management system, pardon me, by having a single unified quality policy under the control of a quality assurance manager who has the requisite skills and abilities. And by the way, we have clients who have four people in their company, and they're doing this. So it, it is completely scalable if you understand the nature of how this system should work and work to an effectivity. I'm just using business practices, not aviation practices, to come up with, with this kind of concept. You need a unified blanket of quality assurance. What is the difference when quality assurance is applied to flight ops, to maintenance, to your administrative piece, and the safety management system? We've got a unified policy. What is that? This is how we do quality. This is how the system works. I don't care whether it's an ISO system, uh, an AS9100. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's a unified quality system that meets quality objectives for whatever system it's going to be uh, uh, challenged against. When we go to maintenance, when we go to flight ops, when we go to admin, what's going to be, and, and safety management, what's going to be the difference in a unified quality system between one area of business and the other and the other? This is why there's a problem. This should be coming to the lips in most cases. It's just the checklists. The checklists against the processes, the policies, and the procedures that you say that you are using, or, or those steps that you say you are doing, to accomplish the task under which you are regulated. And this is, people are having problems with the checklist component. By the way, we have a flight operation, and I'm going to assess training within the flight op department as a part of my internal quality assurance mechanism. Who do you think is best qualified to create the checklist for training within our organization? A training manager? I heard you, uh, did you? Chief pilot, training manager, anybody else? Huh? Line pilot. Let's explore that one for a second because that's my favorite. Who is best qualified to know what exactly is going on on the line on a day-to-day -day basis? It's the line pilot. And we forget. We think that it's going to be a manager. The managerial component needs to be there. For example, 
Quality managers should create an architecture checklist, a standard checklist that we use, and we just change the title and we just change the subject matter that's in the checklist. But it should be the people who are responsible, the managers, and the people who are executing, who are doing the work, that are the best to create the checklist that you need. And then you bring them back up to the management chain because we actually do have some objectives, goals, and targets that we have to meet. And we need to make sure that they're within regulatory, uh, you know, uh, pardon me, not regulatory, but, but policy, process, and procedure uh, uh, definitions that we're looking for. But I argue that you could take those checklists and give them to somebody in that department for a weekly evaluation at the local level, buy-in. Do we do what we say we're doing? Well, Jesus, I helped make this checklist. Uh, I better not do this. I'll give it to the new pilot. He's got some basic audit internal training that says, hey, listen, be objective. Don't check something that you've done on your own. Don't default to what our normal day-to-day um, -day philosophy is. Just simply look at the checklist. They're very clear. Are we doing that? Can you imagine the level of control your organization would have if those people within those departments were actually doing these as a part of, and it doesn't take long, it's actually a quality control mechanism using the people in those departments. And there's a better one. What if pilots looked at maintenance activities and maintenance activities looked at pilots? We do have clients that are doing that. Wow, does that ever expand the level of knowledge within an organization? Very, very cool stuff. And this was just a trick to get me to look at my watch and see how much time you have. So my, my point is, that there are some very unique, very inexpensive, very cool approaches to actually governing this system and deriving the results you need. Now, what you're going to do is create lots of data. And you can start, as a manager, managing and mining that data because it's going to give you an idea, not only at the local level, but also at the organizational level, which is, which is really, really cool stuff. <coughs> so we're going to look at Toyota because this is a classic. And uh, absolutely classic. And I, again, I apologize for not being able to start with the video. <coughs> Consumers were surprised in October 2009 by a series of highly publicized and really tragic fiery crash in, La in uh, the Las, uh, California, Los Angeles area, <coughs> where Lexus, the signature vehicle within the line, actually had that accelerator stick and people died. Immediately after that, Toyota announced it's recalling 3.8 million vehicles. Boom, the hammer drops. Right, there's an expense associated with that, obviously. Uh, this is, it's just a terrible place to have to be, especially for a company that was a beacon of quality. I mean, it was a beacon of quality, revered for its sterling levels of quality, world class by itself, the one that everyone was kind of coming up to. Of course, Deming's influence in the 1950s following World War II is part of the catalyst for what got this going. Definitely indications that the quality level of products had fallen off in recent years. They had internal uh, evidence that the quality of that program was falling off, production program. In the 1960s, they pioneered quality improvement methodology. Following that, they developed the total quality control, sometimes called, called the Toyota quality control because of the T. And it was the genesis, uh, is, there, is there a Six Sigma person here? Anybody got Six Sigma of any kind of, of degree here? Yes, no? What, what level? Yeah, green, green belt. So Six Sigma is probably one of the most intricate methods of, of quality management. That's arguable because now we're talking at the theor theoretical levels again, but, but it's a tremendously powerful tool. The genesis of Six Sigma came from the Toyota program. And Toyota was the first to link quality, customer satisfaction, and profit. In other words, they knew that by going down this route, by empowering their people, by producing a quality product, and making sure that people were happy with that product uh, in front of the actual construction, that their profitability would rise. Um, that forced me, when I started to go down this path, to do a return on investment calculation. Uh, and a study to make sure that I could validate when I talk to CEOs and CFOs uh, in the work that we do, that I had the data that demonstrated the financial uh, success that you could achieve by investing in quality and safety management programs. They are measurable, they are tangible, the data does exist and when you mine it, uh, you can uh, really see the, the concept and how it does work. There has to be a, a, a piece of 
a profitability associated with your investment in that. Th and that's why I say beyond regulatory and compliance. Management philosophy, employee training, and growth were nurtured. So you have to know as a manager what you need to do. You have to train your people, and you have to validate, not by writing an exam, you have to validate that they are actually leaving the program, the training class that you put them in, with the knowledge that you expected them to take away in order to, what my good friend Dr. Tony Kern says, hold them accountable for their actions in the professional role. It's another thing that we don't do well. We do not validate the efficacy or the effectiveness of training for what our intended goal and objective was. One of the tools that you can do that with is a quality system. Are they performing the way we expected them to perform following the training? Do you need somebody who understands quality management when you start to go down this path to get effective quality results, do you think? Is that a fair question? I, I, I think we do, right? I think, I think we need to have someone that does understand quality process well enough and who will continue to learn. In other words, you're getting your pit bull in there who loves quality and just wants to do everything they can. And you have to give them the latitude to learn to benefit your business. By the way, this I'm going off on a tangent for a second. You need to tie financial metrics and performance to quality and safety management systems in order for you to be able to manage them the same way you manage the purchase of a new helicopter, the pursuit of a new client, uh, the cost expenditures that are associated with your business. If you do not equate a dollar sign to your investment in quality, to your investment in safety, I can assure you, you are not going to have a holistic and effective program. You're going to be treading water the whole time. Because you don't manage, it, no matter what you say, safety is a heart and a passion. Take the heart out of the equation. What are we left with? It's a business. How do you run a business? We run a business to make a profit. We invest to make a profit in people and process and new tools and new technology. If you don't do that with your quality and safety programs, ouch. Because you're not treating it the same way. No matter what you say, you're not treating it the same way. So a basic principle of risk management, identify the risks early, eliminate them while there's still minor problems. We do that in a structured way. Toyota executives had a number of warnings about deteriorating quality. I mentioned that already. Following the initial recall, we had another 3.8 million recalls for a total of over 7 million. That number's going up. So too is the cost. The cost for not maintaining quality. In 2010, a Gallup survey found 36% of the Americans felt that Toyota vehicles were unsafe. Just think about that. Pre-2009, 14% were polled. God knows why they would do a poll like that, but 14% felt that Toyotas were not safe. I, I would argue that that 14% may not be a realistic number because that was probably just somebody saying that, right? Well, I, well, I heard, so on and so forth. But following that, look at the damage to the business. Over a third of the community felt that Toyota vehicles were unsafe in general. May 2011, more than 20 million recalled vehicles, and not specifically for that, that same accelerated problem, but, but there were a host of, as you can probably remember, a host of other uh, quality failure, system failure items that occurred as a result of a conscious decision within Toyota, as we'll see. Root causes, management decided to pursue rapid growth. Increasing complexity of the products and new technology. They, they weren't unable to forecast the types of failures that the new digital and electronic technology was going to introduce to the marketplace. Those types of development structures are moving along rapidly, and so if you have a problem, a system integration problem or a technology problem, and your production line is moving, you have, a, you have that what's the, the big snowball growing behind you as you're running forward to try and pursue new activities, new businesses, new technologies. So those are some of the root causes. Another thing that they did, and here's some of the cost savings, I'm going I'm to translate this into real numbers here. Toyota disbanded a high-level task force that had been set up in 05 to deal with quality issues. That's a positive, proactive, very, very good tool. Right? You've got an independent management team that's looking at quality issues. But then management believed that quality was part of the company's DNA. You know, it's part of our very fabric. It's there. Right? The problem is, who does DNA really belong to right now? In this room, who does DNA belong to? The individual. Yeah, DNA is a part of us. Is DNA a part of this room? 
Collectively? It's not. Although Simon Sinek argues that when you do have that little shot of uh, <laughs> serotonin, uh, you know, from the handshake, that's a good deal, right? We're, we're maybe, maybe we're transferring something here. But my point is, is that DNA does not belong to your culture. It's the wrong attribution. It does belong to the person. They felt that it was part of the company DNA. They didn't need to enforce it. Hence, that committee got taken apart. Politically powerful executives. So the big bosses shrugged off early warnings of the people feeding it up the pipeline. Holy smoke. Can you say Challenger accident? 1986? There's a problem here. Engineers are feeding this back up the system. Not listening. Don't want to hear that. Minister of bad news, don't touch me. Right? It's all good news. Continuity requires clear incentives for the promotion of best practices. Continuity, keeping things on some kind of an even keel in an environment of chaos. I agree, aviation is so dynamic and so changing, you need some solid structure. So continuity is key. Clear incentives for the promotion of best practices. Effective socialization of new employees. At my last job before I opened the company, I was a manager of safety and quality, and we implemented from the grassroots ground up a quality and safety management system. It was the principal role I was hired uh, to, to do or perform. Um, and so there was a point at one point where we had a uh, safety management um, issue that was raised. And one of the identified root causes to that issue was that um, the persons being hired were coming in with extensive backgrounds. They'd been associated with the company in the past and that past, business was done in a certain way. But in the new paradigm, business was being done in a different way. So these guys that hadn't been a part of the transition but had been former employees were now coming back with the old baggage of what was done in the past, which was a slightly different way of doing business. But it wasn't very easy and it wasn't very possible for the day-to-day -day managers who didn't have the skill sets, they didn't have the trained skill sets to identify the safety breakout points. Because remember, this was a system in transition and growth. Th these were new systems. People were just learning them. So it, it's not reasonable to expect that the manager handling that day-to-day -day operation actually could recognize that, oh yeah, well that's great, we've known this guy for a long time. That, that's one of the hiring tactics, and it's a good one. Uh, but it wasn't reasonable to expect them to say, oh yeah, but your safety activity from previous work time with us is going to have to change. So the root cause analysis suggested that in this case, the safety manager or a delegate would actually perform a quick interview of that person coming in. And for me, it's a very simple one. You know, if it was I and myself doing it, it would be, so tell me about safety. Tell me about your role in safety. And very quickly, it's very easy to identify as a safety professional. It's very easy to identify, are they telling you a line? Or are they actually telling you from the heart and what they believe and what they know? Uh, so the idea was, run that person through a safety question, right? An in-person safety question. Guess what? It was never done. Never done. Never implemented, never changed. Guess what happened? Right in front of a large client, a person left the machine with the engine running, rotor blades turning. Holy smokes. Yeah, and you've got a safety program. I can see that. <laughs> Went in and had a coffee. Why? Because that person came from a background that had thousands of hours in a tolerant environment to that risk in the middle of nowhere where nobody saw anyway, but because the pressures put on by the client at that place and in those times was such that that's what they wanted the person to do. That person just came with some baggage that just was not appropriate for this environment. By not having that objective view and by not using your own skills knowing that in this environment these are the bad habits, in this environment these are the bad habits and so on, by not compiling those into an entry uh, employee interview or, or, or um, evaluation, those points were lost. So the knowledge that was there was not applied. And it became an interesting thing. So effective socialization of new employees is what I was really trying to say in a few short words. Supportive organizational culture, adhering to processes, strong problem solving processes. These are some of the things that you needed in that Toyota example. But it really was management's decision-making process that was flawed. Exe executives did not respond aggressively to early signs of quality problems. So 
The reason I brought that example up was because we responded through the mechanism we had that was the safety management system as a result of a report and an evaluation of root cause. We put in and agreed to an activity, but that's what happened. Executives or managers failed to respond aggressively to early signs of problems. We came up with a solution, we just didn't apply it. How many times has that happened to anybody? Come up with a solution, didn't apply it, because it's the next flavor of the day, right? You're, you're, you're busy. There has to be structure. There is no such thing as corporate DNA. I made that point earlier. It doesn't exist. You can't rely on it, let's put it this way. There are no guarantees that the systems and values that have provided the foundation. So in other words, there's no guarantee that past history and past events are any guarantee of something going forward unless you renew that commitment in a physical, tangible uh, way with your organization. And this is where I drop off the beam and I talk about my good friend John Cotter from Harvard. John Cotter tells us that after 35 years of theoretical research and as the world's preeminent management of change guru, that 70% of all change management activities fail. 70% of all business change management activities fail because we can't sustain the essential ingredients that are necessary and there are eight steps to managing change. Have a look for it. John Cotter, K-O-T-T-E-R, management of change. There are eight steps that he puts forward and I can assure you that if you were to employ those eight steps to a management of change exercise, you would find a greater level of success. Because as Dr. Patrick Hudson says, it's about a two year time frame for change actually to be implemented, incorporated into an organizational culture. So think of what that means for anybody that's running companies here. You've got to be, you have to be clear and sustained in that message of commitment for about two years. Because as soon as you drop that message, we're not changing. Because this change that's taking place is a change which is not in an emotional state. Human beings change in an emotional state. Think about a relationship that you've had. Think about a loss of a loved one, all of those things. You go introspective. You begin to reflect. You look at what could I have done differently? What, what was good? What wasn't good? Uh, when, you, when you get angry, when you have these uh, disputes with colleagues or with friends or family or whatever, it's at that point when we are under emotional stress. What happens if your company has had an accident? I, I watched a company who had an accident implement the most complex and bought in pre-flight helicopter risk assessment I've ever seen. And of course, when I looked at it and I said, are you guys actually using this? Oh God, yeah, you, 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 let's, let's show you. And they started pulling out all these risk assessments that these old time pilots would never have done had they not lost colleagues in an accident. The time was right. It was a classic indicator for me of the fact that we do change under emotional duress. But this type of change is the one that requires prolonged attention to detail. It's part of the management complexity. It's, it's not intuitive. Total cost, $3.1 billion. Do you know how much they saved by disbanding the management team and by switching from, uh, from uh, a, a program of quality to growth? This is astonishing. It was $100 million that they were looking to save. Look at the cost of that $100 million. That's now reflected by the one, <laughs> you know? So how did that little cost savings exercise go? Pretty challenging. So managing in a quality environment, management responsibility for creating the system. All of our people are different. We have to have effective on-job training, transfer those skills within your organization that are good, that are getting better by refinement through measuring through quality and safety and train on the job. Break down the barriers between departments. That's why I was saying cross pollinate for the audits. Man, boy, did people ever learn a lot about each other when you start doing that. And there's a lot of resistance to that change, by the way. Responsibility of supervisors must be changed from, if we focus on quality, we're going to get higher levels of productivity. If we focus on productivity, we're gonna have a Toyota accident that cost us $3.1 billion. Hmm, good lesson learned. Vigorously support education and self-improvement. Vigorously. I encourage you. Here's the problem. 
we've got pilots and we've got engineers. They are siloed, right? They're very well educated and trained, undergoing training all the time, from ab initio all the way right up through to the highest levels of performance. They're doing the same thing in the engineering side. How many here have succession plans in their company, identifying people who are gonna be good future leaders and then training them in the areas of business management and responsibility that they're gonna need when they take that job over? Or are they just such good pilots and just such good engineers that we're gonna push them over the management line now and say, man, you were a great pilot, man, you were a great engineer, we, would you want to be a manager now? And everybody or many people are going to go, yeah, I'd, I'd like to do that. That's a great professional recognition in my career. But my question is to you, that PhD of piloting and that PhD of, of engineering is not supported when they cross the management line and they become a manager, not of the aircraft or of the maintenance process, but of people and process in order to accomplish effective flight and maintenance operations. It's another big flaw in our system. And it comes from the fact that we were entrepreneurial in our day, we were a pilot, we were an engineer, we saw a business opportunity, we opened and created a company, we built a big business, but we didn't have the business management skills. We learned by baptism by fire and we're subjecting our people who probably aren't necessarily entrepreneurial to those conditions that you, you yourself might have survived, but if we analyze your management style and tactics, we're probably not seeing the continuity that we need for advanced quality and safety performance. That's the world that we live in, and that's why we're continuing to, or continuing to do that. Plan globally, and glo by globally I mean across the company, and act locally in the department. You have to have a plan. You have to have quality checklists for the individual departments created by the people who are working in the environment, managed by the people who are responsible for managing. Ruthlessly apply QA during times of stress. This company that I was telling you about that had this significant management of change activities going on but, but really can't put their finger to where they are. The next line of defense is to have a robust quality system. So even if you didn't have a good management of change process, you could raise the level of quality assurance activities by doing specific focus checks against good checklists and that's raising the team's level of awareness. Oh yeah, we're in a lot of change and gotta make sure we're doing things the way we say. So that was my next scenario. I was looking for, okay, if you don't have a good management of change process, you can't really say where you are at any given time along this, this roadmap. Do you have enhanced quality assurance activities taking place to keep this thing in check? No, they didn't. So guess what we're left with? What are we left with? The last line of defense, the pilots and their risk management activities at a personal level and the engineers and their risk man management activities at a personal level. You are on the last line of defense, and not by design. People unwilling to comply, engage, and report will affect quality. Can we demonstrate that we do what we say we're doing? Because that's what advanced auditing is doing. It's saying, can you demonstrate that you do what you say you're doing? Leading and lagging indicators are really, they're about, you know, lagging. It, it's confirming that something's happened or is about to happen. and. There's a great example of a, a lagging indicator. We've got a speed, we've got an RPM. We don't know how long we can keep that up. That's a lagging indicator. That's something that's happened. If we throw this piece in here, oh, now we can do something. I got a full tank of gas. I can keep this up for quite a period of time. There's a leading indicator. Now, I, I'm very simplified, I'm, I'm being very simplified and distilled, but I want to get you into this thought of leading and lagging indicators to determine where your performance is. We can tell where we've been or what we can anticipate, and we can tell how far we can do it or, or where we're gonna go, given the information. And those are the kinds of metrics that you wanna track. And where do we apply this? Well, I would argue that we have to make sure that we have compliance first to our policy process and procedures, which ultimately is regulations. So measure those things first in your quality system. Don't make it impossible. Once we're comfortable that we have our system performing as we had designed it and planned it and what we're regulatory uh, uh, obliged to do, then measure the level. Is management supporting the continuance of this? That's the next, next metric that you're going to start to measure. Is management actually doing what they need to do to keep us in compliance and keep our business running the way we expect it is? And then finally, move into the third level and assess our people. When you start to assess your people, when you're in compliance, when you are, are getting the management um, a participation that you need to keep this going, keep the engine going, tie personal performance evaluation into a person's actual activities to support 
that we do with Sailor Dan. There's, there's three nice levels to work from. Quality is a part of the social fabric. Engage subject matter experts in checklist. Seek the feedback. Is this working for us? What's not? Because you're on the line. I'm not anymore, but I, I think I know what we're doing. Checklist for policy, process, and procedure. Do we say what we say we're doing? Can you prove and demonstrate that, no, not only to yourself, but to, to those that are looking at you from the outside? Qualify and document your auditors. Make sure that you, again, hold true to the fact that the training that these people have is appropriate for what they're doing and that they can, with the tools they need. It's like the boroscope guys. I picked guys that wanted to find problems, trained them on the boroscope. Guess what? I didn't complete the story. We had zero cylinder failures on two Mars with 144 cylinders clicking away for that season, 150 hours each aircraft. It was a fairly significant amount for us that year. Zero cylinder failures. We changed 10 that were, that were either exhibiting cracks or suspect for cracks. That's what quality assurance looks like if you want to start from ground zero, build a system that entails all of those things I was talking about. That's maintenance, flight ops, how to start, how to finish, how to get from A to B, how to measure your progress. It's a quality process roadmap. And I think that gives us about a couple of seconds for questions if anybody's got any questions. And of course, we've got a guy here, I heard that, oh, that's a picture I took from the window of the Mars. It was one of my former students from BTIT. I was so happy to see that. And it's astonishing that things are turning, things are moving, exhaust is coming out. And this is all within a quality and safety managed environment. Comments, questions? Uh oh. <laughs> Back to the drawing board. Thanks, folks. Really appreciate it. Uh, privilege and a pleasure to be here with you.